Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another chemistry review topic. This one is 1.02 measurements. Today, you're going to learn how to make proper measurements by recording your measurement one place smaller than the calibration marks on your measuring device. So the question is, how do we give meaning and dimension to our descriptions of the world around us? If you say that something is big, then what exactly does that mean? Big in comparison to what? For example, when I go out shopping, sometimes I'm told, make sure that you get a large head of lettuce. Well, large compared to what? What would constitute a large head of lettuce? If I tell you that a friend of mine is very thin, well, what does that mean exactly? There's just so many different ways to measure that. So measurement gives precise meaning and dimension to our descriptions of the world around us. Now, the data that you collect is the most crucial part of the scientific method. First of all, any claims that are made must be testable and the tests must be reproducible, which means what you do is you publish the results of your test and your test methodology. This way, other people can try what you did and see if they get the same results. The results must be able to be proven false. You must be able to throw the kitchen sink at it. And then the data itself will be the evidence with which we evaluate those claims. A scientist, above all else, must be honest in reporting the data. Otherwise, what reason would you have to trust what they're saying? There are so many people out there who are trying to make a quick buck by fooling you into thinking that their science is actually science when it's actually more pseudoscience. For example, would you trust a company that produces certain pollution to actually do a test to prove that that pollution wasn't harmful to people? They have an economic advantage in saying our pollution won't harm you at all. And therefore, can you really trust their data? You must be honest in reporting your data. The measurement is the method by which you collect that data. Okay. Now, a good system of measurement should be easy to replicate. In other words, it should be based on things in the real world. It should be used globally so that everybody can communicate. After all, we do have a global economy. We do order parts for our products from all over the world. So it's important that we speak the same language. Now, the English system is not used by very many countries. Uh, basically, our old feet, pounds, gallon system of measurement, eh, it's kind of limited as to who uses it. But on the other hand, the metric system, an international system of units, is a global system. And if you're working in science, then you're going to be working in the metric system. Now, the old English system still has some utility. If you're doing cooking, then the metric system is not strictly necessary. We can still operate in cups and quarts and pints and teaspoons. But for the purposes of science, we want things to be as precise as possible. And therefore, the metric system is the best system that we have yet come up with to figure it out. It is the global language of measurement. Now, what are these metric units? Well, we have a unit of distance, which is meters, and you can have fractions of that based on powers of 10. So for example, a 10th of a meter would be a decimeter, a hundredth of a meter would be a centimeter, a thousandth of a meter would be a millimeter, so we use prefixes to represent powers of 10 of any particular metric unit. So distances in meters. Grams would be mass, pascals for pressure, kelvin for temperature, moles for amount of substance, joules for amount of heat, seconds for amount of time, and liters for amount of space occupied, which we also call volume.
And by the way, if you look at the front page of your New York State chemistry reference tables, you will find a reference table that has these units and more on it. Now, how exactly do we do measuring? Well, if you look at a measurement device, there are calibration marks. Those are these individual little markings that are on your measuring device, or these markings here, or these individual markings here. When you read a measuring device, you always read it one place smaller than whatever place the calibration marks are. So for example, in this ruler, this is the ones place, which means each of these calibration marks would represent a tenth of this unit. So since the measuring device is actually labeled to the tenths place, you would estimate between these lines, squeezing out one more place, the hundredths. So you will read the measuring device one place smaller. This is the tens place, meaning these represent the ones place. So you would estimate to the nearest tenths with this measuring device. Tens, ones, so you would estimate to the nearest tenth. We call this precision, the place to which the measuring device is actually read, one place smaller than where it's marked to. And scientists will spend a tremendous amount of money to buy these instruments that have the highest possible degree of precision. And you'll see why when I show you how to round off answers to math problems. Having the highest number of recorded digits is going to give you the best results in your math. So for example, this balance right here, which records to the nearest whole number gram, is relatively inexpensive, $114. And if you only need to go to the nearest gram, let's say you're uh, weighing your food for dietary purposes, you really only need to go to the nearest gram, then a balance like this will be perfectly acceptable to you. But if you're doing some really hardcore science and you need a lot more precision, you can get this analytical balance. Now, this particular balance is marked to the 10,000th place. This actually has a digital readout. When I was going to college, you actually had an analog readout and there were some things you had to tweak in order to read it properly. It's actually pretty cool. And you'll notice that there's glass windows around this. This is so that the air currents don't disturb the item that you're measuring because even the tiniest air current can change what the value of the mass is. So this is to seal it off from air currents. There's a little door you can open to place your sample in. But when you handle your sample, you can't use your fingers. You have to use some sort of dust-free handling um, well, you can use what are called Kim wipes to do it. They're dust free, or you can use gloves that don't have any dust on them because the oils in your fingerprints actually weigh enough to show up down at the 10 thousandths of a gram. So you got to be really careful when you handle a device like this. Now, what do you think the price is going to be? Remember, this one cost $114. So what do you think this device is going to run? Well. $5,300 the last time I checked, which was in the Sergeant Welch catalog in the July 2016 website. Now, it's probably gotten quite a bit more expensive since then. You are going to pay for precision, but you know what? You only pay once because when you get this equipment, you take good care of it and you have it serviced regularly to make sure that it maintains its precision properly. So estimating one place past the calibration marks, what does that look like? Well, in this particular device, it's marked to the nearest tenth of a centimeter. So you would estimate one place smaller than that, which would be to the hundredths of a centimeter. So this line right here is definitely six point something. It's between six and seven. This is 6.1, 6.2, 6.3, 6.4. Now, it's between 6.4 and 6.5, so we can call it 6.4 something. But it's closer to the 6.5 line than it is to the 6.4 line. In fact, it's almost right on top of that 6.5 line, but not quite. 
So our measurement could be anywhere from 6.48 to 6.50 centimeters. Your eye may actually see this line as ending directly on the 6.5 line. So that last place that you're measuring, there's a little bit of leeway there. Although if you were to say 6.41, that would be completely incorrect because 6.41 would put it somewhere around here. This would be 6.45, 6.46, 6.43. So you take your best guess in that last place. For this measuring device, this is the tenths place, and this right here is the ones place. So what you do is you estimate one place smaller than the ones place, which would be the tenths place. The measurement, therefore, would be 27 point, well, it's a little less than halfway between 27 and 28. So 27.5 to 27.7 would be appropriate. 27.9 would not be appropriate. On this device, it's 7.6, although it's just a hair over. Now you'll notice that this particular line has both the tenths place and the hundredths place. This is 0 0.60, 0 0.61, 0 0.62, 0 0.63, and so on. So it's marked the hundredths place, which means you got to squeak out one more place, the thousandths. Now, in this particular case, this is 0 0.60 and this is 0 0.61. So this is 0 0.60 something. It's less than halfway between the two values. Therefore, 7.601 to 7.603 would be acceptable. 7.609 would not be, nor would 7.605, which would put it directly in between the two lines. So you take the best possible guess. So this line right here, which appears to end directly over the 14.6 mark on the ruler. It's marked to the tenths, so you read it to the hundredths, and since it's directly on the line, we would call this 14.60. Since it can be read to the hundredths, it must be read to the hundredths. Although there's a little bit of leeway, we would accept it 0 0.01 on either side of that. There is a tiny range that you can have. If you call it 14.63, mm, that would be too high. Now, um, start here. This is marked to the ones. So we're going to read it to the tenths. It's a little less than halfway between. 6.2 would be a good answer. For the second one, the device is marked to the tenths place, which means we'll read it to the hundredths place. It's a little more than halfway between 0.4 and 0.5. Therefore, 0.46 would be appropriate. This next device is marked to the tens place, which means we read it to the nearest ones. It's a little less than halfway between 60 and 70. So 64 would be an appropriate measurement. Okay. Now, let's say we're measuring the same paper clip on three different um, rulers. In this first one, it's a little less than halfway between zero and 10. So we could call it four centimeters. In the second ruler, it's between four and five, a little less than halfway. So we can call it 4.4 centimeters. On this more precise ruler, it's between 4.45 and 4.46, 4.55 possibly. So, or actually it was a little more than that, 4.58. The idea being that as you increase the precision of your measuring device, you can get more digits out of it and more digits will help you later on when it comes to doing the math and rounding off your answers. Now, implications of improper measurement well, maybe you don't get your new furniture through the door 
or into your living room. Maybe you don't see properly because you didn't have your eyes measured properly. Maybe your car car doesn't work properly because that spark plug gap isn't right. Maybe you get pulled over for speeding because you weren't obeying the posted speed limit by looking at your speedometer. Maybe spacecraft get lost and crash into the planet that they were destined to orbit around. Any kind of horrible consequence, bridges could collapse or babies could die. Now, if you're in my class and you improperly measure during a lab, I'm going to tell you this by saying you just killed a baby. Don't kill babies and don't put them in lobster pots and boil them either. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is just the beginning of the horrible things that could happen if you don't measure properly. And that is the end of this presentation. Thank you so much for joining us. And until next time, this is Mark Rosengarten with Chemistry Review. View, 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 view.